Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining part six of our series on satellite observations and tools for fire risk detection and analysis. Today, we'll be revisiting the topic of vegetation as it relates to fire, uh, but this time we'll be discussing the application of data from satellites and sensors to post-fire landscape evaluation and assessment. I'm sure you're all familiar with the breakdown of this webinar series by now, um, especially if you've attended all of the sessions, but here's a quick reminder of the topics we've covered so far. Uh, the topic of fires touches various earth systems uh, at the pre, during, and post-fire stages of the fire cycle. And this webinar series engaged our entire team of RSET trainers across our water, land, disasters, and health and air quality teams. Now the session today is the last in our fire series, so after today, you'll have completed the full training. So today we're gonna to be discussing the role of post-fire vegetation evaluation and mapping to assess fire impacts and vegetation regrowth. My name is Zach Bankson, and I'm based out of the NASA Ames Research Center in California. And I'm also joined by my colleagues, Juan torres Brez and Amber McCullum for this training. We're also joined by a guest speaker, Blanca Rios from the National Autonomous University Center for Atmospheric Science in Mexico City and she'll be presenting her research on air quality impacts from biomass burning uh, later today in our Spanish session, um, and I'll be presenting her slides during this session. So since this is the last session, I wanted to remind you that the webinar recordings, PowerPoint slides, and homework assignments for the full series can be found here at the link on the slide. And if you have any questions after the training is over, uh, please feel free to contact Juan or I via the email addresses provided here. So we'll also have a Q&A session at the end of the presentation, uh, but if you still have any questions we're not able to cover, uh, please, please don't hesitate to send us a message. So first I'll quickly go over what we'll be discussing today and then we can go ahead and get started. All right, so first we'll be discussing uh, fire life cycle dynamics, uh, touching on important concepts like fire regimes, burn severity, um, and vegetation recovery and resilience after fires. Then we'll talk about ways to map burned area extent, burn severity, and post-fire vegetation regrowth. And similar to session two, we'll go over tools uh, available online that are useful for vegetation-based fire applications, but this time for post-fire metrics. And we'll finish up with a case study of biomass burning and associated air quality impacts in Mexico City uh, before moving on to a summary of the full training and our Q&A session. All right, so jumping right in, uh, let's start off with some information about landscape fire dynamics. So fires play an important role within vegetated landscapes. Uh, burning can clear dead biomass like leaf litter and debris, um, improve nutrient availability within soil, and open up canopy, allowing more sunlight to reach the forest floor, uh, which stimulates new growth. We've provided a simple infographic of this uh, from the National Park Service. In this example, the ignition source is lightning, uh, burning takes place over the vegetated area, uh, returning nutrients to soil, um, allowing for new growth of grasses and other plants. Over time, this growth continues, uh, regenerating vegetation within the area, and dead biomass debris accumulates, um, and the area once again becomes crowded with vegetation. And then this process of burning kind of repeats itself um, after another ignition uh, years later. So as I mentioned, this is a really simplistic example of fire disturbance and its impact on the life cycle of vegetated areas. Uh, but burning within a landscape occurs at different intervals, uh, depending on the fire regime and vegetation types within the ecosystem. For example, fires may burn more often in shrubland dominated ecosystems as opposed to forests. So now it's super important that we acknowledge the impacts of climate change on fire frequency and intensity. Over the past several decades, warming temperatures have increased the potential of fire occurrence um, on a global scale. High temperatures and low humidity are two essential factors in fire risk and activity, as you probably remember from previous sessions of this training. And we expect continued increasing trends in temperature and decreasing trends of humidity under the effects of climate change. Record-breaking fire seasons, like those we saw in California in 2020, are already demonstrating how these impacts can affect fires. And climate-related impacts can increase fire frequency, disrupt historical fire regimes, and contribute to higher frequent fire intensity and burn severity. So this is a pretty timely topic that we're uh, discussing within this series. 
So fire regimes are a critical foundation for understanding and describing effects of changing climate on fire patterns and characterizing their combined impacts on vegetation in the carbon cycle. Fire regimes typically describe and categorize patterns of fire ignition, seasonality, frequency, type, severity, intensity, and spatial continuity that occur in a particular area or ecosystem. Fire dynamics in any given area depend on a variety of factors, many of which we have covered within this series, including climate and weather patterns, vegetation composition and fuel structure, path management, landscape characteristics, timing and severity of fire, vegetation regrowth, and current and future landscape management. It's also important to note that there's local variability in fire regime classifications. On the right, we have a conceptual diagram of a fire regime. Note that the three factors which determine a regime are ignition sources, atmosphere conditions, and resources to burn. I mean, these factors uh, dictate fire interannual variability and long-term averages. So an important component of fire assessment over time is the fire return interval. This is usually defined as the average period between fires under the presumed historical fire regime. Fire interval provides a useful temporal metric describing the normal or expected occurrence of fires over a number of years. And intervals vary from site to site depending on the unique ecosystems found within each landscape. And we have an example of a fire interval map from 2012 for the United States. Um, so note that these interval estimates are likely out of date given recent changes in fire patterns. Um, but within the figure, you'll notice that these interval estimates range from less than two years to hundreds of years, um, with especially high variability across the Western US. Now, fire intensity is uh, the amount of energy or heat released per unit time or area and can be described by a variety of fire intensity metrics. Traditionally, uh, fire intensity is considered the rate of energy or heat release per unit time per unit length of the fire front, uh, regardless of its depth. So fires of different intensity tend to look very different and have the ability to burn vegetation and soil to different degrees. Um, and fire intensity is an important a uh, component to keep in mind since it's a major factor in determining the severity of burning. Which brings us to an important mappable metric for post-fire assessment. Burn severity is the effect of a fire on ecosystem properties and is often defined by the degree of vegetation mortality. Uh, usually we think about burn severity as a way to measure the degree to which a site has been altered or disrupted by a fire um, with severity determined by uh, fire intensity and residence time. So vegetation is not the only ecosystem feature impacted by fires. Uh, soil burn severity is also an important factor in assessment of overall burn severity. Uh, fire induced changes in physical, chemical, and biological soil properties impact the hydrological and biological functions of soil. Severely burned soil contains less organic matter, um, but more available nutrients. And burned soil also makes landscapes more vulnerable to erosion and runoff, uh, which you all went over in session five. So here we have a figure to quickly summarize the effect of fire on the land surface. This illustrates the effect of fire intensity on above ground vegetation, as well as below ground soil properties. And you can also see the transition of landscape properties from the during fire stage to the post fire stage. So when we talk about burn severity, we're typically referring to the changes in both vegetation and soil properties that we see um, after a fire event. And before we dive into the use of satellite sensor data for post fire assessments, um, I want to mention some of the ground-based methods that um, we attempt to approximate with remote sensing. Uh, field observing of the burn scar mosaic is a typical method for defining a detailed burn area. Um, and field burn severity assessments often complete a composite burn index, or CBI. Uh, the CBI was developed to assess fire effects on vegetation and soil. CBI plots rate uh, the burn severity for substrates, uh, herbs, low shrubs, and small trees tall shrubs and, slapping, and sapling trees, intermediate trees, and big trees. And then each of these categories are rated to determine burn severity. And then the ratings are averaged for each category and then across all plots to provide a burn severity rating for the entire study area. Syndex is particularly useful for comparison with satellite-derived satellite burn severity. 
And water repellency tests are also a useful uh, metric for examining soil burn severity, um, with more water repellent soils representing higher soil burn severity. And ground-based assessments of vegetation regrowth often look at post-fire tree injuries um, and determine tree mortality over time. Um, after a fire event, some trees are injured uh, rather than completely burned. So this uh, assessment accounts for mortality over time um, related to that initial fire injury. Field observations of vegetation regrowth also provide information about the recovery of an ecosystem um, over varying timescales. So from a remote sensing perspective, we usually assess post-fire landscape impacts with two metrics, burned area to determine the spatial extent and location of burn scars, and burn severity to determine the relative impact of a fire on a landscape. So we'll go over this more in the following slides, uh, but you can see here an example of burned area and burn severity. Um, and with these two metrics, we're really able to use remote sensing imagery to assess the extent and magnitude of fire impacts over large areas. So in remote sensing assessments of vegetation regrowth, we typically use vegetation indices and land cover classification methods to assess the presence and health of vegetation over time post burn event. And fortunately, we already went over many of these vegetation assessment methods in part two. So you might wanna review the materials from that part after this session as well. I provided an example on this slide of a study which used normalized difference vegetation index or NDVI to assess post-fire vegetation recovery at coal mine rehabilitation sites in central Queensland, Australia. And researchers used a differenced NDVI or DNDVI subtracting a 12 month and 24 month post-fire NDVI estimates um, from post-fire NDVI measured immediately after burning. And this DNDVI provides a metric for vegetation regrowth. And as you can see within the figure, regrowth occurs continuously over the two years after fire. Um, and we're gonna go over more examples of vegetation, ve vegetation regrowth assessment uh, later on in the series. All right, so let's go more in depth about burned area and burn severity mapping uh, with satellite data. First, it's important to understand how optical sensors use spectral information to examine vegetation condition under typical circumstances. So here we have the spectral response curve of vegetation plotted um, over the electromagnetic spectrum from 0.4 to 2.6 micrometers. Um, in healthy vegetation, there is a relatively high response in the green portion of the spectrum due to chlorophyll pigmentation. Um, and there is also a high near infrared response due to healthy plant cell structure as well as a relatively low response in the mid-infrared range uh, due to water absorption. So when we compare healthy vegetation spectral response curve to those of burned areas, we notice some stark differences. You can see this pretty clearly uh, for the spectral response curves of low, moderate, and high burn severity where healthy vegetation has this large peak at the near infrared um, and bare soil and burned areas have much lower peaks in the near infrared. And in the case of high severity burned areas, there's much less response in the near infrared as well. You can see that healthy vegetation has low reflectance in the short wave infrared, uh, but burned areas have high reflectance in those wavelengths. So with these spectral characteristics, we can identify burned areas and distinguish it from healthy vegetation. To take advantage of this difference in spectral response uh, between healthy vegetation and burned area, we use the normalized burn ratio, or NDR, to map post-fire conditions. NDR uses remote sensing data at the near infrared and shortwave infrared to map burned areas and ultimately assess burn severity. So you can see how this calculation is completed here on the slide. Similar to NDVI, NDR is a unitless value from negative one to one. A higher NDR value uh, that is closer to one indicates healthy vegetation, while a low value that is closer to negative one indicates recently burned areas in bare ground. NDR is a commonly used metric for identifying areas where vegetation has recently burned due to fire. 
Um, and here you can see an example of NBR in action. Uh, the images show pre, during, and post-fire NBR uh, from the Mendocino Complex fire uh, that burned in California in 2018. I and mean, the area in red outlines the total area impacted by fire. NBR is also critical to burn severity estimates. To estimate severity, we compare NBR pre and post fire using the difference to normalized burn ratio or DNBR. Here we have a super basic run through of how this works. Uh, first, we calculate the NBR prior to the fire and after the fire, and then take the difference between those images. You'll note that the DNBR is calculated by subtracting the post-fire NBR from the pre-fire NBR. And then once the uh, DNBR is calculated, um, an analyst will need to threshold the DNBR values um, into classes of low, moderate, and high burn severity to produce a map that looks like the one you can see there on the right um, with the highest burn severity areas mapped in red. There are suggested threshold values for burn severity thresholding. I um, mean, we'll show some examples of this as well as tools um, that will suggest appropriate thresholds a little bit later on. So using this approach, we can identify the severity of a fire. I just wanna briefly mention a variant of the difference to normalized burn ratio called the relativized difference normalized burn ratio or the RDNBR. This was developed by Miller and Thode in 2007. The RDNBR attempts to account for differences in vegetation between areas with high and low vegetation cover. It measures relative change in regards to the pixels. Uh, so for example, sometimes areas with low canopy cover appear to experience uh, low burn severity simply because there was less vegetation cover pre-fire. And the RDNBR would attempt to correct this by noting a higher relative change in vegetation loss within this area. So RDNBR is not always appropriate for use in, in every study area, um, but it's commonly used along with the DNBR. For our purposes in this webinar though, um, we'll only be referring to the DNBR from here on out, um, but I just wanted to mention this relati relativized version um, in case it seems applicable for your specific needs. All right, so before we dive deeper into burn severity estimates and examples, I wanna mention some useful burned area products. You'll likely remember some of these uh, sensors and products mentioned in sessions three and four, and I hope you paid special attention to the burn area, to pro area products the instructors went over in these sessions. Um, but I'll go ahead and provide you with a couple of data product links you might find useful. <clears throat> the first is the MODIS burned area product. The MODIS sensor's high temporal resolution means it can track burned area extent at a daily time scale. And MODIS has also collected data over the last 20 years, uh, providing an excellent record of burned area in recent history. The product I've linked here is the most commonly used Terra and Aqua MODIS combined burn area product. Um, and it provides monthly global gridded 500 meter per pixel burned area. Um, and burned area for this product is calculated with an algorithm that uses a burn sensitive vegetation index uh, to create a dynamic threshold um, that's applied to the data. This is also the sixth version of the product, um, and it's less sensitive to clouds and aerosols than previous versions. I also wanna mention the, the Veers burned area product. It's really important to note that this data uh, is provisional and should be used with caution uh, due to issues identifying burned area at the edges of inland water bodies and at high latitudes. Um, but this data product um, is still in its first version, and the second version um, of this data product will deal with these issues, um, kind of with the ultimate goal of making it as reliable as the MODIS product that we just discussed. Um, and the hope um, with this is that it will ensure the continuity of a 500 meter burned area product in the event that the Aqua and Terra MODIS sensors are decommissioned. Another burned area product produced by NASA is the Landsat burned area product. This product leverages the Landsat series to provide pre-processed burned area estimates at a spatial resolution of 30 meters for the United States. Um, and further information about the Landsat burned area algorithm um, and data access are available um, via the link uh, to the product provided here. On the right, you can see an example of this product in action. Uh, the August complex fire in Northern California was ignited by lightning storms in mid-August of 2020 and fires in the area had consumed over 1 million acres uh, by the morning of October 21st. 
Uh, the burn scar mapped here using the Landsat burned area product uh, shows the extent of the scar on October 19th, um, while areas on the edge of the scar were still burning. So Landsat data is also very useful when calculating normalized burn ratio, which as we discussed is a critical metric for mapping burn severity. And the Landsat NBR is derived using surface reflectance data from near infrared and shortwave infrared bands. Uh, for Landsat four through seven, these bands are four and seven. And for Landsat eight, these bands are five and seven. So the resolution of this NBR is 30 meters. And you have the option to calculate this yourself uh, using freely available Landsat scenes from around the world, or you can even order the data product from uh, the USGS for your site uh, within the United States. So this brings us into our first example of burn severity assessment. Here's an example of using uh, this Landsat NBR to calculate a difference to NBR for burn severity mapping in California. Uh, the two San Francisco Bay Area fires we will be referring to are named for the fire response units that responded to these events. Uh, CZU stands for the San Mateo and Santa Cruz unit, and SU stands for the Santa Clara unit. In August and September of 2020, the CZU and SCU Lightning Complex fires burned 86,500 acres and 396,000 acres, respectively. And NBR was calculated using Landsat 8 imagery from a pre-fire date of July 24th and a post-fire date of September 26th. The post-fire NBR was subtracted from the pre-fire NBR to calculate a difference to NBR for both fires. And the values were thresholded at intervals of 0.25 to estimate burn severity with the dark brown areas uh, representing the zones that experienced the highest burn severity, um, as you can see here on the map. It's really important to note uh, that burn severity and total burned area don't always go hand in hand. Uh, the SCU Lightning Complex fire had a much larger burned area, uh, but the CZU Lightning Complex fire had higher burn severity, um, which you can see here in this map. So Lanta isn't the only satellite platform you can use to map burn severity. Sentinel-2 is also a great option for this type of analysis, and it can provide you with a higher spatial resolution of 20 meters. The methodology for calculating uh, NBR and DNBR for Sentinel-2 data is similar to that of Landsat. And the map you see on the right was created as a part of a training designed by the United Nations Space-Based Information for Disaster Management and Emergency Response Program, or UN SPIDER. This training uses uh, Sentinel-2 imagery in QGIS to calculate NBR, DNBR, um, and implements uh, suggested thresholds to map burn severity of uh, February 2017 fires in Empedrado, Chile. Um, and you can see an example of that here um, with the map on the right um, using Sentinel-2 to map burn severity in the study area. So I highly, highly recommend checking out this training and others available through UN Spider. They're a great place to get started with your own burn severity mapping. I mean, I've provided a link here to their GitHub where you can find trainings to map burn severity with Sentinel-2 and Landsat-8 using QGIS, uh, Google Earth Engine, R, and Python. So it's a great resource if you're interested in engaging with any of those tools as well. So we've been talking a lot about the use of optical data in burn severity and burned area mapping, but synthetic aperture radar or SAR data is also useful for this purpose. Um, though it's not necessarily as, as commonly used as op optical data is. I have a simple example here um, showing the use of Sentinel-1 SAR data to examine burned, air, burned area and severity in savanna ecosystems in Northern Australia. Sentinel-1 data is recorded in decibels and at horizontal and vertical polarizations in this studies. In this study, uh, researchers found that vertical, horizontal, or VH backscatter was sensitive to the structural changes imparted by fire and was correlated um, with a normalized burn ratio calculated using optical data for the same area. <clears throat> so here we have an example of large scale detection of savanna burn on Australia's Tiwi Islands. And the lower left map shows optical assessment of burn severity using the differenced NBR. And the lower right map shows the same area mapped using differenced VH backscatter data um, from SAR. So you can see that the SAR data does a good job of approximating the burned area and severity determined with optical data. And the use of SAR data for this purpose is, 
is becoming more and more frequent. So definitely keep an eye out for more research using methods like this. Um, and one really big advantage uh, to using SAR data is its ability to see through clouds. I'm kind of eliminating any cloud cover issues or limitations uh, that optical data may experience for your study area. So moving on to our next topic, let's discuss mapping of post-fire vegetation regrowth. I want to quickly provide some context for post-fire vegetation regrowth. Fire disturbance within vegetated ecosystems prompts secondary succession. Um, and secondary succession, in our case, refers to the process of plants reestablishing themselves in a habitat after it has burned. And the process and timeline of this reestablishment varies across different ecosystems. In the case of forests, um, a simplistic progression through this process could include uh, first colonization by grasses, then shrubs and young trees, and then ultimately mature forest. It's important to keep in mind how vegetation regrowth occurs within your particular ecosystem of study um, so that you can be informed about what types of vegetation you might expect over time. So now we'll go over a few different ways in which you can estimate this regrowth with remote sensing. The first metric we'll discuss is one that we've already kind of talked about extensively. Um, the NBR can be a useful metric for mapping vegetation regrowth over time. Higher NBR values, uh, those above zero, can indicate vegetation regrowth in burned areas. And I've provided an example of this um, on the slide from a study that mapped Landsat NBR post-fire every year for five years um, in three Canadian boreal forest sites. So you'll note that over the course of the time series, NBR values generally increase. Um, and this is shown in shades of green. I mean, this increase is seen over time um, in burned uh, and barren areas across the three sites. So this can be a really useful and easy metric to use um, for vegetation regrowth, um, especially if you're already using NBR to assess uh, burn severity in your study area. Now, moving on to some other methods we can use to assess vegetation regrowth, um, you'll be happy to know that we've, we've already covered quite a few. So in part two of this series, uh, we went over a variety of ways to assess vegetation type, extent, stage, health, structure, and moisture. Um, for this session, however, um, we're gonna focus on the use of land cover classification and vegetation indices to map regrowth. Uh, but note that many of the parameters that we discussed in session two are also helpful for characterizing vegetation um, and regrowth uh, at the post-fire stage. So vegetation indices are particularly useful in the mapping of green up as new vegetation growth is prompted after fire disturbance. You'll remember that from session two, uh, we discussed three vegetation indices useful for mapping vegetation, um, and these were the enhanced vegetation index, uh, the soil adjusted vegetation index, and the normalized difference vegetation index, or NDVI. So here we have an example of vegetation regeneration in Wyoming using the NDVI derived from Landsat 5 and 8 imagery. In the summer of 1988, lightning and human caused fires burned a large area within Yellowstone National Park as you can see in the post-fire image from 1989, and a total of 793,000 acres of the park burned. You can see vegetation regrowth at 10-year uh, intervals over the burn scar, but you'll also see that portions of the burn scar are still visible um, even up until 2019. So vegetation regrowth can be a really slow process, um, and it's important to consider uh, the timescale that you're using post-fire when you're mapping vegetation regrowth. Now, from a land cover perspective, I want to highlight a project completed by participants of the NASA DEVELOP program. DEVELOP is NASA Applied Sciences Workforce Development Program, and it engages early career scientists in remote sensing projects focused on applying Earth observations to environmental issues. I mean, in this project, uh, the fall 2020 team based out of DEVELOP Colorado used NASA Earth observations to map the change in Aspen extent in Southern Colorado um, after the 2018 Spring Creek fire. So partners at the Colorado State Forest Service and the Trinchera Ranch were interested in mapping post-fire aspen conditions for management purposes, um, given the importance of uh, aspen for wildlife, watershed health, and ecosystem resilience in the area. 
So here you can see a burn severity map of the Spring Creek fire. Uh, the fire burned about 108,000 acres total, um, 9,100 of which were within the extent of the Trinchera Ranch Partners Management Area. So this project provides us with a good example of using land cover assessment methods uh, for pre and post fire vegetation comparison. So to complete this assessment, uh, the team used ground-based observations, Landsat 8 data, and Sentinel-2 data to train and run several random forest models that detect pre- and post-fire aspen extent. This represents a method of, of supervised land cover classification to assess vegetation. Um, the supervised portion of this is the use of field observations to train models to detect particular vegetation types. So this method relies on a user input to identify vegetation across an entire image. And you'll note here that the team's pre-fire estimate completed for 2017 shows a much higher percent cover of aspen throughout the burn scar when compared to post-fire estimates completed for 2019. And this type of methodology is also useful for identifying vegetation regrowth, but it can be really limited in the short term. Uh, for example, the methods described here could be useful in mapping aspen regrowth um, a number of years after the fire event, um, as opposed to just one year after the fire event. I also want to give a quick plug for the DEVELOP program. Um, if you're interested in building remote sensing and professional skills, uh, then you might be interested in participating in DEVELOP. So land cover, land cover classification is also useful for estimating a variety um, of land cover types uh, post-fire to assess changes in vegetation composition uh, prompted by post-fire regrowth. And we have an example of this here. Um, in this study, researchers used Sentinel-2 data to complete a supervised classification of previously burned uh, forested areas in Serbia. And this land classification took place at yearly timescales uh, from 2016 to 2019. And here we show some maps uh, for, the, for two of the study area sites. Um, and you can see that over time, vegetation regeneration occurs, encroaching on burned area cover types uh, like charring and dense grass cover. Um, and replacing these types with uh, bushes and young broadleaf trees. So measuring regrowth in this way can provide an important vegetation type metric uh, that might help you track stages of succession uh, within your study area. So that wraps up our discussion of vegetation regrowth. Um, and now we're going to cover some useful online tools for post-fire mapping, uh, many of which you'll recognize from other sessions. So we mentioned land fire in session two to map vegetation type, cover, and height for fuels characterization, uh, but land fire also includes useful fire regime products. Um, this includes uh, fire frequency and severity products um, that are useful for mapping of fire regime groups um, and intervals, as well as percent low severity, mixed severity, and replacement severity fire. On the right, you'll see a screenshot of the land fire interface displaying fire regime groups across California. You can see a lot of light green areas across the state, um, especially in Northern California, where some of the state's largest fires in 2020 occurred. Um, and this color corresponds to fire regime group one, uh, which is characterized by frequent fires at an interval of zero to 35 years um, and typically low burn severity. Landfire also has vegetation departure products, which include uh, vegetation departure, vegetation condition class, um, and succession class. Uh, here we have a screenshot of Landfire displaying succession class for Northern California. Um, this can be helpful in understanding vegetation composition and successional stage within your chosen study area. Landfire also includes useful disturbance maps, uh, disturbance data, is available annually and historically, and as well as for fuels and vegetation types. Vegetation disturbance data also includes transition magnitude, uh, forest vegetation transitions, non-forest vegetation transitions, and forest vegetation simulations. And here we have uh, historical disturbance data for California. And you can see that there are many wildfire disturbances uh, mapped in red across the state. Now I know we just went over uh, quite a few data products so I've included a link here to the data specifications for all of the land fire layers um, for your reference. Um, it's also really important to note that the extent of land fire is limited to the United States. All 
All right, I want to briefly touch on the NASA Fire Information for Resource Management Systems system or firms. I know session three and four covered firms in depth. So definitely refer back to those sessions for demonstrations and additional information. But for the purposes of this session, uh, firms is a great place to view global modus burned area estimates. Um, and the near real-time data capabilities are also useful for rapid response to fires. Okay. So the Monitoring Trends in Burn Severity Project is a great resource to use for mapping burn severity. Um, and this project provides NBR, DNBR, um, as well as burn severity classifications and fire perimeter data. And these maps are created by technicians that are familiar with the areas in which they're working, um, as well as the analysis approach for assessing burn severity with Landsat. So the project only works within the US, uh, but I think it's a really good idea to reference the methods M MTBS uses for your own burn severity assessments, um, kind of regardless of where your study area is located. MTBS has a few tools available online that we're gonna go ahead and go over now. The first MTBS tool um, is their Data Explorer. Uh, this tool is relatively new and was developed in Google, in Google Earth Engine. And you can explore the MTBS burn severity archive um, with this tool. Um, but also just keep in mind that the current archive is limited to burn severity estimates from 2018 and earlier. Um, eventually, I believe the entire archive will be explorable from this platform, um, but that's just not currently the case. Um, the Data Explorer also allows you to create summary statistics within the interface um, over a user-defined area, and you can analyze single point data at resolution of 30 by 30 meters, um, since all of the estimates are derived from Landsat data. And you can also download data directly as a CSV or PNG. Um, the design of this interface um, is really engaging, um, and it's a great way to interact with the data. Um, an example of this on the right, um, uh, which is a screenshot of burn severity from the 2018 Mendocino complex fires in California. So I've also included the MTBS Interactive Viewer, which is a web map interface for exploring the MTBS data archive. It's less complex and has less functions when compared to the MTBS Data Explorer, um, but it currently provides access to the entire MTBS uh, data archive, including 2019. Um, which makes it currently more up-to-date than, than the Data Explorer. But I think this is going to change as the Data Explorer continues to be developed. You can also download burn severity and fire perimeter data from this platform, either for a single fire event or for many in a bulk download. Um, and the interactive viewer um, is a little bit more simplistic than the Data Explorer, so you might honestly find it more user-friendly if it, if it works better for you. So the QGIS Fire Mapping Tool, or FMT, was created in partnership with MTBS um, and was developed to address the needs of users who may need to determine the effects of small fires that are below the MTBS burned area threshold or who cannot wait for an MTBS assessment to be published. It facilitates the identification and processing of Landsat imagery that correspond to a user-specified area of interest, um, generates fire perimeters, and performs thresholding of the Landsat imagery to pr produce fire, uh, sorry, burn severity images. Through the use of this tool, users can employ satellite-based imagery and derivative information to produce their own burn severity estimates. And this tool is fully open source and it's freely distributed, so you shouldn't have any issue accessing it. Uh, the link to download the tool is provided here. There are two versions of the tool, one for QGIS 2 and another for QGIS 3. So you should be able to download the plugin for whichever version of QGIS is currently on your computer. Uh, but I believe that use of the FMT is only available for Windows users. I also wanna plug a past RSET webinar here. Uh, the techniques for wildfire detection and monitoring training includes an exercise using the FMT in QGIS 2. So if you're interested in this tool, um, definitely use that link here on the slide um, to check that training out and maybe complete that exercise yourself. So here's a quick rundown of the FMT process for defining a fire perimeter and burn severity assessment, uh, just to give you an idea of kind of how this works. First, you use another data source like WorldView or Firms to identify a fire. Then you use um, FMT and QGIS to enter fire information and order imagery. 
And then you'll need to identify pre and post fire images. And then you'll follow the instructions provided uh, with the tool download and prompts from the tool itself uh, to walk through the steps of mapping a fire perimeter as well as burn severity. So this is a really great option, kind of like we mentioned for, for a variety of reasons. Um, you might be interested in engaging more directly with burn severity mapping. Um, you might be interested in evaluating a small fire that MTBS won't be mapping themselves. Um, or you might not be able to spare the lag time it takes for uh, the MTBS project to create these maps and release them to the public. Um, if, if any of that applies to you, this is definitely a great tool to use to kind of subvert some of those issues that you might have accessing MTBS data um, or for completing your own burn severity assessments. Now, I think we went over GWIS for burned area estimates in a previous session, but I just want to quickly plug it again uh, for burned area estimates on a global scale. As we discussed earlier, the MODIS burned area product, um, which is also available through GWIS, is your most reliable option for burned area mapping. Um, but you'll note that the last update to this data set for GWIS um, as of this presentation was the end of 2019. So I've displayed the near real-time MODIS and Veers burnt area layer. Um, be cautious when you're using this product, um, since it's not as reliable as the science standard MODIS product, um, but it can be useful if you need access to more recent estimates of, of burned area or fire occurrence. Okay, so we'll go ahead and move on to our case study review. Uh, we're excited to present research from Blanca Rios and her colleagues Bradford Barrett and Graciela Raga of the National Autonomous University Center for Atmospheric Science in Mexico City. Uh, Blanca will be presenting her research in the Spanish session, um, but I'm going to do my best to walk you through the case study um, during this session. So we'll be discussing smoke emissions from biomass burning in central Mexico and its impact on air quality in Mexico City. This work does a really good job of tying together data products we've just discussed in many of our sessions. Um, and we really hope that it provides you with an example of how uh, the concepts we've covered throughout the series can kind of come together to address complex applied science research questions about fire. So in the 90s, Mexico City was famous for being one of the most polluted cities in the world. The implementation of air quality regulations um, has resulted in a decrease in emissions over the last 30 years. To illustrate this point, um, this graph shows how the atmospheric con concentrations of lead, sulfur dioxide, and carbon monoxide have been significant, significantly reduced. However, even though ozone, PM10, and PM2.5 concentrations have also decreased, they are still at levels that are above the respective air quality standards. Air quality in Mexico City is generally poor, and specific meteorological conditions can cause rapid deterioration of already bad quality. For example, uh, Barrett et al. in 2019 studied a high ozone event that occurred in March 2016. This case involved an unusual cutoff, low circulation associated with a stratospheric ozone intrusion. And Silva Quiroz et al. in 2019 have shown that extreme surface ozone observed in Mexico City during March through May is associated with positive anomalies of geopotential height at 500 hectopascals. While Barrett and Raga in 2016 have shown the strong modulation exerted by the Madden-Julian oscillation on surface ozone concentrations observed during all seasons in Mexico City. So fires constitute one of the most important agents affecting terrestrial ecosystems. They're widely used to manage and transform land for many purposes, including the clearing of forests, for pasture or agriculture. Um, under favorable ambient conditions, initially controlled fires can quickly expand, burning over several days, and smoke plumes will be affected by winds, ultimately affecting remote areas. For example, in 1998, fires in Mexico and Central America not only reached Mexico City, um, but smoke was observed from satellite imagery to affect the central plains of the United States. Then several studies carried out during the Milagro campaign showed that the composition of fine particles in the city indicated the presence of chemical markers emitted uh, by the local fires that contributed to fine, part fine particle mass. However, they did not mention the possibility of long-range transport of smoke plumes from fires in states beyond the ones that directly border Mexico City. 
Therefore, Blanca and her team decided to carry out an analysis of the meteorological conditions for the most polluted days in May 2019 in Mexico City uh, to determine if poor air quality is influenced by emissions from biomass burning in neighboring states. They also calculated specific humidity anomalies since 1979, and it's important to note that although 2019 is not an attention-grabbing year, it is the driest year since 2010. So from the 10th to the 17th of May, Mexico City experienced a very serious air quality problem, which can be seen in the graphs uh, showing average daily concentration of carbon monoxide, PM2.5, and ozone at five air quality monitoring stations from the Rama Air Quality Monitoring Network in Mexico City. And here you can see how concentrations of PM2.5 and ozone increase during those days, while carbon monoxide remains almost constant. The air quality in the city was being influenced by the regional transport of pollution pollutants. Moreover, fine particle concentrations were elevated throughout the city, including through the night, which is not typically the case um, under normal urban conditions. <clears throat> so they mapped the Veers I-band 375 meter active fire product for May 10th to the 17th in 2019 to determine the spatial distribution of burns in Mexico. And as you can see on this map, many fires were observed in the central western states of Mexico, and these emissions could be advected toward Mexico City um, and worsen air quality. And I just want to reiterate the motivation for the study um, quoted here on the slide. The motivation for this study is to learn more about the meteorological conditions and emissions of pollutants that combine to result in the extreme poor air quality episode experienced in Mexico City in May 2019. In particular, the goal is to identify the sources of the regional pollution, the type of fuel burned in the fires, and the predominant transport patterns. So the study region was selected by analyzing 48-hour air parcel retro trajectories from May 10th to 18th um, at four different times um, in the NOAA high split model to identify air parcel trajectories uh, that arrive in Mexico City. In these data projections, uh, like the one seen on the left for May 18th, it was observed that many of the air parcels uh, come from the Pacific coast and pass through the border between Guerrero and Michoacan, as well as from the north of Veracruz. So since air movement results were consistent across study dates, uh, they chose a study extent that includes these air movement patterns. I mean, you can see the study extent here um, in the map on the right, along with a land cover vegetation map of the study area. Uh, using the MODIS land cover product. To meet the objective of this study, several analyses were carried out with data from MODIS and VIRS. Emissions from the fires were estimated and data from some meteorological variables were used along with several air parcel retro trajectories carried out with the NOAA high split model. And the graph on the right shows the daily burned area by land cover type within the study region from January to May with a zoom in on the data for May below the main graph. An increase in burned area is observable since, since April. However, a significant increase is not seen in burned areas until May. Two main land covers uh, with burn activity can be noted. Um, those are shrubland and forest, and both show their maximum burned area on May 8th, followed by May 10th, 13th, and 15th. The map on the right illustrates the spatial extent of burnt area by land cover in the study region for May. And there are large burned areas within the study region dominated mainly by shrubland burning um, and a few in forest and agricultural lands. So this graph shows the number of hotspots detected from veers within the principal land covers. Almost half of the hotspots detected were during the month of May with the highest values recorded from May 7th to 16th which coincides with the most polluted days in Mexico City. Approximately 40% of fires were detected uh, within forests and 30% in shrubland. However, the burnt area product from MODIS detected more total burned area um, in shrubland sites. Cropland and grassland cover types experienced the least burning, um, and this also coincides with the burnt area pro product from MODIS. So this map on the left shows the daily hotspots um, and carbon monoxide emissions estimated by the Metropolitan Environmental Commission um, in the study region. 
The highest concentrations of carbon monoxide were observed on May 12th and 15th. And these carbon monoxide emissions don't always coincide with the largest number of fires. Um, this could be due to the intensity and duration of the burns, as well as the advection of the smoke column. The graph on the right uh, presents the daily carbon monoxide emissions from burning for May in the principal land covers um, of the study region. And there are two days that exhibited the highest carbon monoxide emissions, um, and those are May 15th and 18th. This figure also shows that carbon monoxide emissions from forest and shrub fires exceed uh, by almost three orders of magnitude the emissions from agricultural and grassland fires. Based off of these results, uh, Blanca and her team came to the following preliminary conclusion um, that I'll go ahead and just read to you verbatim. Although we still need to carry out other meteorological analyses, the evidence indicates that emissions from biomass burning in Guerrero, Michoacan, and the state of Mexico affected air quality in Mexico City during May of 2019. Back trajectories highlight the potential for regional transport of smoke from neighboring states. So this is just a, a really great example of tying together a variety of data products we've discussed uh, throughout the series uh, to determine the source of smoke related air quality impacts in Mexico City um, by linking things like burned area, land cover, uh, hotspots and emission data um, to modeled estimates of air movement. And I just wanna take the opportunity to thank Blanca and her colleagues for providing us with such a great case study that ties together um, kind of these pre, during, and post fire conditions we've been talking about um, over the last six sessions. Um, and with that, uh, we'll go ahead and move on to a final summary of our fire series as a whole. So I'll just be going through some main points from each of the sessions uh, to give you a quick review of everything we've talked about over the past three weeks. In session one, the instructors demonstrated how remote sensing and modeled data can be used for monitoring weather, climate, and hydrology conditions at the pre-fire stage. And they also went over some NASA tools to access and visualize this data on a global scale. They also covered how to identify precipitation, soil moisture, and temperature anomalies that can indicate fire risk in the subsequent fire season, and the fire weather index for tracking moisture content of different fuel sizes and potential fire behavior. In session two, we explored many methods of vegetation condition assessment using remote sensing uh, to characterize fire fuels for pre-fire risk assessment. And we discussed many vegetation-based fuel characterization metrics, um, including ways to look at vegetation type, extent, stage, health, moisture, and structure. And then we went over a variety of sensors and tools useful for examining fuel vulnerability to fire ignition and spread. In session three, the instructors identified satellites that provide fire detections worldwide on a daily basis and in near real time, as well as satellites that provide fire data over a large time series and at higher spatial resolution. They also demonstrated the utility of worldview and firms for visualizing and accessing active fire detection data. And then they covered smoke detection and aerosol optical depth data from NASA and NOAA for monitoring and tracking smoke in the atmosphere and then highlighted daily NOAA estimates of PM 2.5 through the aerosol watch online system. Part four of the series discussed the use of burned area products, active fire detections, and fire radiative power for estimation of trace gases and aerosols from fires, and then went on to show how these emissions along with plume height, fire duration, and variability in fire strength are used in atmospheric chemistry models to simulate the transport of smoke. So the instructor then demonstrated how to use GFED and GWIS websites to download and visualize GFED and GFAST fire emissions, and noted that NASA and the European Center for Medium Range Weather Forecasts offer forecasts of atmospheric composition. In session five, the instructors discussed the short and long-term impacts of wildfires on water resources. They noted methods for monitoring post-fire erosion and runoff transport of sediments, debris, and chemicals to streams and reservoirs, and they showed how post-fire debris flow and water quality can be, model, can be modeled and monitored using remote sensing. In today's session, uh, part six, we noted that fires are an important method of dynamic change in ecosystems, 
and we covered burned area products and burn severity assessment uh, to identify vegetation loss and landscape change. And we also showcased the usefulness of vegetation indices and land cover assessment for monitoring post-fire vegetation regrowth. And lastly, we highlighted a variety of tools useful for post-fire mapping. And that brings our six part series on satellite observations and tools for fire risk detection and analysis to a close. A big thank you to the entire RSET team and our guest speakers for completing the longest and most collaborative RSET training series in the history of our program. So great job, everyone. So a couple of reminders about the homework and certificate for this training. There are three homework assignments, one each for pre, during, and post-fire sections. Uh, for those interested in a certificate of completion, you must submit these homeworks in order to receive the certificate. Um, and answers must be submitted via Google Form, which can be accessed from the training page on the RSET website. And the due date for all three homework assignments is June 10th, uh, which is two, re two weeks from now. Um, and that certificate of completion will be awarded to those who attend all live webinars um, and complete the homework assignments by that deadline of June 10th. Um, and you'll also receive this certificate approximately two months after the completion of the course from Marinus Martins. So here's our contact info again, uh, just in case you have any questions about today's session um, that we weren't able to cover in the Q&A session. Um, we've also provided links to the training page, uh, the RSET website, and to our social media. Um, we really encourage you to follow us on Twitter to stay informed about upcoming trainings and events. And with that, thank you all so much for joining us over the course of the past three weeks. Um, and we'll go ahead and proceed to our Q&A session for, for part six of the series. Awesome. So, so just as a reminder, you can go ahead and drop any questions that you might have um, uh, in the Q&A box here and go to webinar. Um, and we'll try to get to as many questions as we can, um, but we'll go ahead and just get started with the first. Um, and then any questions that we're not able to address um, over the line here, we'll go ahead and, and fill out answers to and post in the Q&A doc on the website. Cool, so let's start with our first question, which is how sensitive is NDVI in regrowth areas? Uh, for example, especially in pixel saturation issues. So this really depends on the type of vegetation common within your area. Uh, but NDVI is usually pretty sensitive to green up resulting from vegetation regrowth. Um, it, it also depends on the sensor that you're using. Uh, for example, Landsat's 30 meter, meter resolution NDVI might be more sensitive in your area because of its higher spatial resolution. And kind of an alternative to that, if you need something with a higher temporal resolution, um, then something like MODIS NDVI is going to be better for you um, since uh, the return of the MODIS sensor is daily. Um, so it kind of just depends on that trade-off between uh, spatial resolution and temporal resolution based off of your needs. Um, and you'll also remember that we went over a couple of other vegetation indices, uh, like the Enhanced Vegetation Index, um, which tends to be a little bit better for more densely vegetated areas, and the Soil Adjusted Vegetation Index, which is better for um, less densely vegetated areas. Um, I would say that in the case of fires, uh, the soil adjusted vegetation index is potentially going to be a little bit more relevant um, just because uh, that vegetation index uh, controls a little bit more for bare soil, which is something that you'll probably encounter a little bit more within burned areas. Um, uh, so it, it's just important to keep in mind that those vegetation indices might be more appropriate um, depending on the vegetation type that you kind of expect within your particular area. That said, NDVI is a really good kind of go-to vegetation index that has a lot of research done on it. Um, it's pretty commonly used, um, and the data that we have um, with NDVI assessments is pretty reliable. I mean, as far as uh, within pixel saturation goes, um, that can be challenging kind of for any sensor, depending on the spatial resolution especially. So if you're finding pixel saturation issues, um, not detecting vegetation or not detecting green up, um, since there's so little relative vegetation within your study area, you might want to look at sensors like, like Landsat, like I mentioned, with 30 meter resolution, or maybe something even higher, um, like Sentinel with like a 10 to 20 meter resolution.
Awesome. So question two, uh, the GWIS website has a MODIS and VIRS near, near real-time burnt area data. Uh, can you explain the methodology and algorithm for obtaining this data? Is burnt area calculated from only one post-fire image and one pre-fire image? Um, and is the quality of the near real-time data much worse for the monthly product? Much worse than the monthly product. So um, I provided a little bit of information about how this MODIS and VIRS uh, near real-time burnt area product works. Um, and I'll go over that a little bit. Um, but then we'll start talking more about kind of the caveats between the two data types and, and kind of what makes the uh, MODIS product uh, at this point still a little bit more reliable than these near real-time data products. So the burnt area information generated in the GWIS NRT product is based on the combined uh, use of thermal anomalies uh, for MODIS and VIR sensors for delineating uh, single fire perimeters, um, which are then used to estimate the burnt area caused by the fires. So GWIS uses uh, the active fire detection provided by the NASA firm's uh, website, which we've gone over in, in this session and some past sessions as well. Um, and this product relies more on thermal anomaly data uh, rather than surface reflectance of burnt areas, um, which makes it a little bit less reliable um, in terms of an assessment of burnt area um, than the MODIS monthly product. Uh, the MODIS product is created using a burned area algorithm that classifies burned area after fire is extinguished. Um, and with this product, analysts that create the, uh, the data will assess the quality of this product to make sure that the burned area classifications are as accurate as possible. Um, and I've provided a little bit more information here um, in the link for that GWIS near real-time product. Um, the caveat that I'll say here is that with this near real-time product, um, you're, you're typically looking a little bit more at the perimeter of, say, thermal anomalies or hotspots. Um, and less at the, the full impact of burning within that area. Um, so you might miss things like uh, dead or dying vegetation, a number of weeks or months post fire. Um, you might also just be getting an idea of what the thermal conditions are in the area rather than the full burnt area of the landscape. Um, so the near real time product is great for kind of that rapid response assessment of a burnt area, but it's not necessarily um, quality controlled or created in the same way as, say, like the, the MODIS burned area product. Um, it's just a little bit less reliable when it comes to full burned area mapping. Um, that's a caveat with, with most burned area mapping in general. Um, you want to make sure that you're giving um, your landscape enough time to fully display the effects of fire um, before you make any final assessments about the total burned area and burned area perimeter within that area. That said, you can kind of assess that burned area at whatever time scales are important for you, um, whether that's immediately post fire, a couple of weeks after the fire, months after the fire, years after the fire. It really depends on um, the metrics you're interested in um, in terms of burned area. All right, let's see. Question three. Uh, which instrument is best for calculating the severity of burn percentage in the high vegetation area and those areas which have hotter climates? Um, so the most commonly used sensor uh, for assessing burn severity um, in our experience is the Landsat series. Uh, the 30 meter resolution of Landsat and uh, the available standard, standard operating procedures are usually sufficient for burn severity mapping needs. Um, kind of across landscapes, but you might need to adjust your thresholding of that difference to NVR uh, value to more appropriately capture uh, the magnitude of vegetation loss in your study area. Um, so you can take a look at some of the procedures and uh, brief explanations of methodologies that the Monitoring Trends and Burn Severity Project uses um, here at this link. Um, and I would say that this is definitely a, a little bit more related to the, the conditions that you see within your own um, Ecosystem. So, so if you're talking about a high vegetation area with hotter climates, um, you would expect to see um, a higher overall amount of vegetation, which in that case might not be detected um, in the same way that something that is more sparsely vegetated would be detected. Um, so as you'll remember, we mentioned with the relative difference normalized burn index or normalized burn ratio. Um, sometimes that relative amount of vegetation per pixel isn't really captured within burn severity assessment. Um, so there are kind of two ways to get at this. You could use the relativized uh, difference normalized burn ratio, um, or you could adjust your thresholding um, 
to account for how burn severity works within your area. And what that would look like is essentially saying, these are the NDR values that we see within the area, um, and this is the amount of severity that we believe um, equates to uh, these values. And you could adjust your thresholding that way to get a better um, assessment of what burn severity means within your area. All right, question four. Is the normalized burn index formula the same as the normalized difference drought index? And can we find, um, I believe this is the normalized hotspot index with Landsat 8 data. Um, and the normalized burn ratio is, is different from the normalized difference drought index. I'm not sure exactly which calculation you're speaking of in particular, uh, but the drought index I'm familiar with uses NDVI and the normalized difference water index. Um, and you can find more information about this NDVI um, assessment here at this link. Um, and I would say that we don't typically recommend hotspot analysis with Landsat 8 data, uh, since Landsat doesn't have many thermal bands and the temporal resolution of kind of like the 16 day revisit time isn't usually sufficient for capturing um, a lot of during fire metrics. Um, so for hotspot analysis, you're gonna look at um, a, lo a lot of the things that they went over in sessions uh, three and four, um, as well as things like MODIS, VIRS, um, those sensors that have really high revisit times with, with daily data that can be used to detect hotspots, um, which does limit your spatial resolution a little bit. Um, but in the case of hotspots, uh, temporal resolution is definitely something that matters because you want to make sure you're capturing um, those during fire conditions kind of as they're happening. And say maybe getting two images per month isn't usually sufficient for that, which is why we don't typically recommend Landsat. See, in question five, how quickly is the difference normalized burn ratio assessed after a fire and published? So this really depends on the area in question. Um, some procedures will say that you should wait a number of months post fire to ensure uh, fire related vegetation mortality is captured. Um, if you're interested in a full assessment of total vegetation damage and loss post fire, um, you'll likely wanna wait that a uh, couple of weeks to months after the fire at least. Um, and the MTBS project uh, even waits to publish burn severity maps at a yearly time scale to ensure that mapping is done correctly. So this really depends on some of your own needs and kind of what you're attempting to do with this DNBR. Um, so if you're just looking at burn severity, you're gonna wanna pick a time when you believe that all of the fire impacts have kind of radiated throughout the landscape um, within the burn perimeter. Um, that say trees that were injured during the fire, potentially dying in the, the weeks after a fire. Um, you wanna make sure that smoldering or any final uh, active burn areas are extinguished before you do your final, final burn severity assessment, um, things like that. Um, and that will depend on um, your own specific fire, the fire that you're mapping um, and the vegetation that you find within that area. And I'll also say that if you're using the, the difference normalized burn ratio as a way to um, look at vegetation regrowth, um, you're gonna wanna use a pre-fire image, say um, maybe a, a month to a couple of months before the burn event. Um, and that will be kind of your baseline for what vegetation looked like or for what the landscape looked like before any burning happened. And then you can do this differencing at, at various timescales post-fire. So say you wanna have a difference normalized burn ratio um, a month after uh, the fire's extinguished, another month after, or even a year, two years, three years, um, kind of into the future. It's a really good way to kind of assess regrowth of vegetation and then also how that, burns, uh, that burn scar looks over time in terms of severity. All right, so we'll go to question six. What is the formula for the relativized difference normalized burn ratio? How is this formula different for, from uh, the DNBR? Um, so DNBR uh, is the pre-fire NBR uh, minus the post-fire NBR, and in contrast, the relativized normalized burn ratio um, is the difference normalized burn ratio uh, divided by the root square of the absolute value of um, the pre-fire NBR uh, divided by a thousand. So that's um, basically the reasoning behind this is to remove the potential biases of uh, pre-fire vegetation. 
Um, so there's an example here from uh, Miller et al. in 2009 that explains the differences in detail and compares the RD NBR to other measures of fire severity. So we really suggest you look at that. Um, we didn't delve too deeply into the relativized difference normalized burn ratio, um, just because it doesn't always tend to be appropriate um, uh, for every area that we're assessing burn severity. Um, and I would also say that for the normalized burn ratio and the, the difference normalized burn ratio, um, those are pretty commonly used um, typical approaches to mapping burn severity um, and some burned area mapping as well. Um, so that's why we presented those within uh, this presentation, but we in no way really captured all of the methodologies that you can use to do this type of work. Um, that would be really challenging to do within a single presentation. So we encourage you to look at other methods, in, including this relativized uh, DNBR, um, just to see if it's more useful for you. Um, and in the case that you have a landscape with um, of varying levels of pre-fire vegetation, the, the RDNBR might be something that's that's really key for you um, in mapping burn severity in your area. All right, question seven. So could you please tell me how to conduct a water repellency test in the field? Um, so this isn't really within the scope of this training, um, but essentially the, the, the key to this type of testing is the concept that more water repellent soil is seen as more severely burned. Um, and you can go ahead and follow this link to how the US Forest Service does this type of work in the field. Um, and I would also say that there's a, a couple different methods for, for doing this water repellency testing. Um, so it will depend on kind of the materials you have available um, and uh, what methodology you think will work best for you. Um, as I mentioned, this is this is how the U.S. Forest Service has at least done it in the past. Um, so it's a good starting point. Um, but you might want to look at some other methods uh, that are used by, say, um, an organization that you're already working with, a federal organization in your area, um, some type of uh, government standard within your specific area for this type of testing. All right. Question eight. So what went wrong with the VIR sensors uh, causing the product to fail in identifying burned areas at the edges of inland water bodies and at high latitudes, um, which is not an issue with MODIS? Um, so this is a, a bit of a challenging question. Um, I think you could do a little bit more research into specifically why this is the case, um, but generally um, I just want to talk about kind of the difference between these two data products and why you might um, see some, some differences in confidence between the VIRS and MODIS products. Um, so the development of burned area algorithms can be a really lengthy process of uh, kind of this trial and error, figuring out what algorithm works best while ground truthing your assessments of burned area. Um, so nothing necessarily went wrong with the VIRS sensors. Uh, the data is just newer and the processing methods are still being refined. Um, so it's important to note that the VIRS product is still in version one while the MODIS product is in its sixth version. So kind of as time has gone on, uh, working with this MODIS data, um, after multiple iterations and multiple versions of this data product, um, they've made it more and more accurate. They've refined the algorithm. Um, they've done some validation, ground truthing um, to assess the accuracy of the product. And so in its sixth version, it's, it's our kind of most reliable suggestion for this burned area mapping, um, at least when it comes to something that has such a high temporal resolution. Um, and as far as VIRS goes, um, analysts, science researchers, scientists and researchers are, are working really hard to get that product up to the same standard as MODIS. It's just gonna take a little bit more time um, kind of as the work of refining that algorithm um, and testing the data is completed. All right, so question nine. Which factors might alter the signal provided by NBR? So one thing kind of upfront with the NBR is that bare soil uh, present before fire might be captured as burned landscape within the NBR, um, but typically uh, land cover mapping prior to a fire can exclude these areas from burned area estimates. Um, so this is kind of an opportunity to engage a little bit more with the NBR, I guess, um, in terms of of what the conditions were pre-fire and how you can kind of control for those as you're doing your NBR mapping. Um, 
So as I mentioned, bare soil can sometimes be um, recorded as burned area. Um, you might also have uh, vegetation degradation or removal resulting from human activity that could be captured um, within a fire assessment within a burn scar as more burning, when really the reason for that might have been um, deforestation or, or, or something else um, human caused. Um, it really kind of depends on that landscape because what the NBR is really doing is just giving you an assessment of that landscape um, before the fire and after, after the fire. Um, but it's not necessarily just detecting any changes that might be from that fire. So, so as I mentioned, bare soil is definitely something that can be captured by the NBR um, at kind of varying degrees and potentially recorded as burned area. And that's something to just keep in mind. Um, and whatever that bare soil is resulting from, whether that is from the fire or from something else, is just also something to keep in mind. And question 10, is the RDNBR only effective for pre-fire tall trees? Um, what about low shrubs that are completely burned? So the RDNBR should uh, be effective for a variety of vegetated landscapes, um, but it's not always appropriate. Um, and I would imagine that the relative difference within each pixel, pixel in a shrubland ecosystem might be challenging to capture um, with the RDNBR as opposed to a forest ecosystem with um, with more easily detected vegetation types. Um, this is definitely something that that depends on your own needs and kind of what you find with with your RDNBR mapping. Um, as I mentioned, this isn't really something that that we've used too much in the past. Um, I think it's worth exploring, um, especially if you have um, sparsely or, or sparse um, vegetation that's not necessarily so densely packed. Um, most of the examples that you'll see are for forest ecosystems. Um, that tends to be where this challenge is most noted. Um, but I would imagine that it could potentially work for an area um, with a different landscape type. But I do think that for a, a shrubland ecosystem, I think my audio just went out for a second. Hopefully you can all hear me now. Um, so question 11, um, have these NVR, et cetera, uh, been validated? How was the validation process? So the NDB, sorry, the NBR procedure has been validated um, over the course of many case studies. Um, the effectiveness of this process varies between uh, landscapes and burn severities. Um, so it's important to do kind of your own literature review of case studies that might be more related um, to your area. In particular, whatever vegetation type that might be, whether that's forest, shrubland, um, things like that. Um, and it's important to do your own validation process if possible. So this could include visiting the burned area uh, to collect ground data for comparison to the NBR values uh, within a pixel. Um, that's kind of the, the gold standard when we're talking about um, burned area and burn severity mapping. If you can go to that area yourself and at least um, take down some ground measurements, um, to see how accurate your mapping is. Um, that's definitely a great way to do a validation. Um, that doesn't mean you necessarily have to observe the entire burned area or the entire area that you're assessing for burn severity. It just means that it's always good to have a, at least um, a few points or a, st a statistically significant amount of points to do that validation for yourself. And that's basically just comparing um, your own visual inspection of burned area or burn severity um, with what you're seeing mapped using uh, these metrics like NBR. Um, but you'll note that kind of throughout the literature, NBR is, is very typically used um, uh, to varying degrees of success, but typically it is kind of our uh, best kind of standard operating procedure for doing this kind of analysis. And I guess one other thing to mention with this question, um, when you're talking about vegetation regrowth, um, and whether that is with a vegetation index or a land cover classification, it's also good to do some, some field investigating of that as possible, if possible as well. Um, we've also used high resolution 
imagery sets. Uh, for example, in the US, uh, the National Agricultural uh, Imagery Project. Um, so that's really high resolution aerial imagery that we can sometimes use to uh, validate uh, things like an NBVI or a land cover classification, um, just to make sure that we're, we're at least doing kind of those, those simple checks to make sure that uh, the mapping that we're doing is accurate. All right, question 12. If it is not possible to create a cloud-free post-fire mosaic operational monitoring, then how can you avoid the misclassification of burned pixels in cloud shadow and plowed field areas? Are there any methods and algorithms that will solve this issue? Um, I want to automate the process of operational burn area extraction from Sentinel-2 images uh, by calculating a D burned area index S2. Uh, between one post-fire and one pre-fire image. All right, so I would say here, um, this really depends on, on your own methodology and your use of optical imagery. I think this is a really good point to highlight um, some of the, the limitations with optical imagery and cloud influences. Um, unfortunately, we don't have too many suggestions with optical imagery um, that isn't cloud-free other than just eliminating as many cloud um, affected pixels as possible within the imagery. Um, our typical recommendation is to, to only use imagery that is less than 20% uh, cloud covered. Um, but I would say that if you have to work with something that has more cloud cover, just try your best to create a composite over the, the full number of images that you have available pre-fire, um, as well as post-fire for this calculation. Um, and in terms of cloud shadow influences, um, that's definitely something uh, to take into account. Sometimes um, you can do your best to eliminate those pixels as well within your analysis. Um, and then it also kind of depends on the uh, product that you end up using um, and what level of processing it's been done to, to surface reflectance. Um, so I don't have too many suggestions for that. Um, but for plowed field areas, um, one, one good way to get around that is to potentially exclude those areas based off of land cover mapping. Um, so if you have a variety of uh, pre-fire images, hopefully you can find one that is cloud-free enough and recent enough to do a land cover classification or to at least look at the, the landscape um, within uh, the fires burned area or around it, um, just to identify areas that could potentially uh, be agricultural so that you're at least aware of um, those, those areas that might have plowed fields that would be misclassified um, as burned area. Um, and then as you're doing your analysis, hopefully you can exclude those areas with that prior knowledge. Um, are there any methods and algorithms that will solve this issue? Um, it's a little it's a little bit challenging there. So I would say you're you're definitely going to want to take a closer look at this, and we'll we'll do a little bit of our own literature review and hopefully provide you with a couple of links um, once we post the Q and A doc on the website. Um, and then in terms of your comment about uh, operational burned area extraction from Sentinel-2 images. Um, we actually didn't touch on Sentinel-2 too much. Um, most of the, the methodologies we're familiar with with Sentinel-2 are very similar to those with Landsat. I'm just using it as another multi-spectral sensor with, with higher resolution. Um, but we'll see if we can find anything else uh, about this topic as well, and we'll hopefully be able to provide you with a link. All right, question 13. Can you talk about the pros and cons of other indices? Um, for example, RBR. Um, also, what factors does one need to consider when choosing between the various indices uh, for burn severity mapping? Yeah, so I would say, at least with what we've talked about um, for the normalized burn ratio, um, your biggest pro there is that uh, this is a really commonly used procedure. There's a lot of uh, literature. There's a lot of institutional knowledge about how um, the NBR can be used for, for burned area and burn severity mapping. Um, so that's definitely a pro with it. I would say with a con, uh, for a con for NBR, it's, it's just like any other um, index or ratio that you're calculating from remote sensing imagery. Um, there are going to be some downsides um, to its ability to classify things that you're interested in. So, so as we've mentioned before, normalized burn ratio can sometimes classify uh, bare soil 
as a burned area, even if that area wasn't burned. Um, that's just a limitation to keep in mind. Um, but I would say a lot of those pros tend to, to outweigh the cons just in um, the ease and the ability to use that NBR as a metric for burn severity mapping, and um, then ultimately calculating your, your difference normalized burn ratio and then uh, thresholding that to get an idea of burn severity. Um, but it's just important to keep those limitations in mind with any remote sensing data product. Um, and then let's see, so what factors does one need to consider when choosing between the various indices for burn severity mapping? Yeah, so, so our thought on that is some variant of the normalized burn ratio or, or the difference normalized burn ratio is gonna be your best bet for doing that burn severity mapping. Um, and then when it comes to, to other indices that we've discussed um, for things like vegetation regrowth, um, that really depends on the, the landscape that you're looking at. Um, as we mentioned earlier, we went over a few of those different vegetation indices. And we also went over a, a variety of uh, vegetation parameters in session two. Um, and a lot of those have their own limitations, some of which we went over. Um, so it's important to kind of keep that session in mind as we talk about um, vegetation mapping, since there's kind of this, this wealth of uh, knowledge base within that, uh, that presentation um, that you can use to, to apply to post-fire vegetation analysis. But I hope that gets at your question a little bit. Um, we definitely have our, our, our thoughts on that standard operating procedure for the NBR. Um, and we're kind of in line with the monitoring trends and burn severity project on that as well. So, so definitely feel free to look at their resources as well. And I, I think we have a few links kind of throughout the presentation as well as the Q&A doc that you can take a look at um, to see how they complete their work and how they account for any um, errors and do their own validation. Awesome. Question 14. Is the Landsat 8 burned area product only available over the US? So at this time, I believe that the Landsat 8 burned area product is only available for the US. Um, I'm not sure if there are any plans for that to be extended um, beyond US boundaries. I'd imagine that the, the algorithm would need to change uh, to provide a global estimate of burned area. Uh, the Landsat 8 burned area algorithm is, is pretty well tuned to the landscapes within the United States. Um, so at this point, that burned area product is only available, I, I believe, for the United States. Um, but there's a lot of uh, documentation, uh, papers written about that burned area algorithm and the procedure for using Landsat 8 data to, to assess burned area that might end up being helpful for you um, in your own burned area assessment. Um, you might decide that creating your own algorithm for assessing burned area is something of interest to you. You might look for other products that complete a similar burned area algorithm procedure. Um, and I believe that there are plans to do more and more of this work with Sentinel-2 as well um, on a little bit more of a, a, a global scale. Um, but I would also say, and we'll provide a link for, for this um, after uh, the Q&A session, um, but I would also say that you have the opportunity to kind of contact uh, the data distribution service that completes this burned area mapping. Um, so that might be a useful resource if you have any questions or if you'd like to know more about how they do this analysis themselves. Okay, question 15. As I see, there are so many programs, tools, apps to study, uh, detect and interpret uh, the fire risk. So my question is, taking into consideration all this observation detection analysis of fire risk, um, is there also a prevention tool or department to avoid all this damage before starting or before becoming a greater danger? So this is pretty beyond the scope of this seminar. Um, and it would depend on the country, its local agencies, monitoring programs that they might have, et cetera. Um, so in terms of, of prevention um, and departments that are working on these fire-related issues, that's really going to vary depending on your country, um, depending on whatever province or state or municipality that you're in. Um, that's definitely a management question that you'll potentially have to ask yourself. And then as far as prevention goes, um, we aren't necessarily um, in the practice of, of prescribing ways to prevent this type of damage since it's so different from, um, since it's so different between different landscapes, different uh, management standards of different uh, places throughout the world. Um, it's not necessarily something that's a one, si a one uh, size fits all policy. So for that, uh, we typically recommend using kind of all of these science products that we've gone over throughout the, uh, the six sessions of the series. 
um, and picking out some of the things that you think are best for assessing risk um, or kind of figuring out those things that you think you can control to maybe mitigate fires, um, but then also acknowledging that um, at some point fires are a, a natural part of the, the landscape. Um, so fire prevention isn't always necessarily um, so cut and dry. I guess that was a really long-winded way of saying that. Um, but yes, you'll definitely have to look at how things work in your area um, in terms of management. Um, and then those management agencies typically have information about um, how uh, large or severe fires are prevented within the area. Okay, question 16. So in recent years, climate change increased the severity and number of fires. How can you use remote sensing to understand how climate change has impacted the severity and intensity in a specific region? So this is a great question. It's not necessarily a simple question to answer, um, but we hope that it's apparent um, kind of through all of the topics that we've covered throughout this series, um, that there are a lot of ways to approach this issue. So we've talked a lot about uh, national data sets or global data sets, um, but it's important to note that all of these data sets can be um, kind of clipped to the extent of your area um, or whatever management concern you might have. And so I would say there's, there's definitely a, many ways to approach this issue. And, and I, I do think that it's something that isn't necessarily, uh, once again, like a one size fits all situation. Um, but within a specific region, um, you're going to want to take an approach that maybe incorporates a lot of the things that we've talked about over the past three weeks. Um, so you're going to want to look at climate parameters, whether that's increases in temperature and humidity, or increases in temperature and decreases in humidity, um, which are really important component for fires. Um, you're going to want to look at uh, what types of fuels you have in the area. So you're going to want to have an idea of the vegetation types within your study area. Um, what that vegetation structure looks like, the moisture of the vegetation, um, as uh, kind of this fuels perspective on what's available to burn within a fire. Um, and then you're also going to want to take into account um, kind of these during fire conditions as well. How have fires in the past or how are current fires burning within your area? Um, can you detect those thermal anomalies? Um, what are the extent of those burned areas? How severely have fires burned in the past um, and recently? Um, so it ends up being kind of this interesting holistic question of um, how can you use the things that we've discussed um, in remote sensing to look at the climate, uh, vegetation, um, and uh, ignition factors that we've talked about uh, kind of throughout the series. Um, and as far as your specific region goes, that's going to be something that, that you determine um, based off of your own needs and I think also the individual fire history within your area, um, which I know isn't necessarily a clean answer, um, but hopefully we've provided enough uh, materials and resources for you to kind of go through um, to kind of figure out what works best for you. All right, question 17. Is there an assumption that post-fire vegetation regrowth is similar species as what was burned in the fire? So this is a, a great question. Um, this kind of get back, gets back to some of uh, the, the content that we discuss, discussed about secondary secession. Um, so typically when an area is burned, um, vegetation will recolonize that area um, within a given pattern or um, within varying uh, species distributions over time. So basically what that means is you wouldn't necessarily expect for the same vegetation to immediately regrow um, after a fire um, unless that's how your specific ecosystem works. But typically we find that there are kind of these um, species that tend to recolonize areas first. So if we're talking about a forest ecosystem, you have a really severe burn. Um, a forest burns completely to the ground and say there's not much left. Um, what you would expect first is uh, the recolonization of smaller plants that could be grasses, wildflowers, um, small bushes, things like that. And then you move on up to uh, things like larger shrubs, um, over time, and then after that, uh, young trees or saplings, um, and then after that, uh, you get this growth of some of the mature vegetation that was present before, um, resulting in something like, say, um, kind of this revegetated forest that looked very similar to pre-fire conditions. So it, it really does depend on the type of ecosystem we're talking about, um, 
but with that um, successional stage theory there, you wouldn't necessarily expect vegetation to um, regrow exactly the same as it was uh, before the fire. Um, eventually, over certain timescales, it might get to that point, um, but typically you're not going to have um, just the same forest regrowing immediately after the fire. Um, and I hope that that was a good way of um, saying that. And you can definitely look back at, uh, I forget what slide exactly it was, but there's a, a chart of that secondary secession um, within the slides. That's, that's a helpful way to conceptualize how that works. All right, and question 18. How accurate is the Sentinel-1 data for mapping uh, the burn savanna, assuming low vegetation? So it's a really good question. Um, I, th I think that with a lot of this uh, Sentinel-1 SAR data usage, especially with the um, case study that we provided within our slides, um, not a whole lot of validation or work with that has been done um, in, in recent history, I think this is something that's definitely um, presenting itself as more and more of a theme within uh, SAR mapping, looking at uh, burned area and burn severity. So I would say that in terms of accuracy, you definitely want to take everything with a little bit of a grain of salt. So for the example that we showed um, for northern savannas in Australia, um, they found a really high correlation between uh, normalized burn ratio um, and uh, these assessments and change of that ver uh, vertical height uh, measurement from uh, the Sentinel-1 SAR data. So with an example like that, um, you can see how these two parameters are related, but I think that relationship is still being sussed out a little bit. And uh, the procedures for mapping uh, burned area and burn severity with Sentinel-1 data um, are still kind of in process and they're getting better and better. And I would say that's something definitely to keep an eye out for because this, the Sentinel-1 data provides a really great opportunity um, to have a little bit higher spatial resolution in some of the optical data that we work with, um, as well as uh, the opportunity to not have to worry about cloud cover since uh, SAR data um, is able to penetrate clouds. Um, definitely keep an eye on this. Um, and I think you'll probably see trends in um, the accuracy and the the standard operating procedures of this type of analysis getting better and better. All right, question 19, does NBR give insight into biomass? I assume biomass is a factor in burn severity. If not, how might one assess biomass with remote sensing data? Okay, awesome. So uh, the normalized burn ratio isn't necessarily um, a, a good metric of biomass. It can definitely tell you where there's vegetation and where there isn't potentially, um, but it's not necessarily something that's going to give you a, a good estimate of total biomass. Um, for something like this, I would I would defer back to session two, um, where we talked about all the different ways that we can assess vegetation from a fuels perspective. Um, and with something like that, in terms of remote sensing, I think you would obviously want to know um, where exactly the vegetation is, uh, the extent to which it exists within an ecosystem. Um, there's also this interesting three-dimensional component when it comes to talking about biomass. Um, so some of the vegetation structure um, analyses that we discussed in, in session two are useful for biomass assessment. I know that a lot of uh, vegetation biomass projects uh, tend to use LIDAR data or some some type of radar or LIDAR data that gets at this three-dimensional structure so that they can better assess biomass. Um, and then alternatively for, for assessing biomass, if you have some type of average or general way to quantify biomass per type of vegetation, um, you might be able to complete like a land cover assessment um, using some of the classification method methods that we talked about in session two as a way to identify where vegetation is located and what type the vegetation is. And then you can do some of your own biomass calculations based off of that. Um, but it definitely depends on um, how accurate you need that biomass assessment to be, um, and then what sensors um, and methodologies you're interested in using. All right, so let's see. Question 20. Is there any tool to check or monitor real-time fires around the globe? Yes, there are many tools for, for doing this. Um, I would defer back to 
Uh, sessions three and four, I believe, went most into the real-time data that's available for fire detection. Um, but just off the top of my head, um, you can look at firms data. Um, that's uh, one of the websites we went over in this session. The link can be found on the slide for that. Um, you can also look at GWIS data, um, which is a good global data set as well, um, which we also mentioned previously. Um, and these will all have metrics for uh, real-time fire uh, assessment. So whether that's um, hot spots for detecting where those fires are located or just detecting them in general, um, or using some of that near real-time data to map, say, a preliminary burned area, um, that's also available. Um, and we've kind of discussed some of these throughout the other questions. One, one that comes to mind from, from what we've just talked about is in GWIS, that uh, Modus and Veer's near real-time product. Um, that's a, a great way to get like a, a quick assessment of where a fire is located um, based off of some of that hotspot data that's available through those sensors, as well as some, uh, I believe, burned area mapping um, to just get like a quick assessment of where a fire is located, um, what its potential extent might be, um, and then you can go back later and see how that that is refined through the MODIS product that's later posted. Um, but yeah, so I would say just off the top of my head, uh, GWIS and firms are probably your best bets for monitoring real-time fires around the globe. Um, but definitely, like I said, make sure you take a look at some of the content in parts three and four. Maybe took a, take a quick, uh, a quick look over the, the PDF of slides that we post on the, the website just to see um, if there's anything else that might be useful. So question 21, for the NBR formula uh, to implement by Landsat 8 or Sentinel-2, can we use uh, the DN value directly or do we need to convert it to reflectance? Yeah, so I would say that a good um, strategy to take with most remote sensing is to use uh, surface reflectance when you can, um, especially since we're talking about land-related um, issues here, uh, that surface reflectance value uh, processed for um, land is typically uh, pretty accurate. It's a, it's a good product to use when you're, when you're monitoring land conditions especially. So uh, I'm sure that there is some some work um, using just the direct DN value, um, but depending on the data that you have avail available, if you can use surface reflectance, that's always, I think, a little bit more ideal, especially for what we're talking about now. Um, and I would say that you can also order uh, surface reflectance process data um, from Landsat. I, I think it's the same for Sentinel too, um, but you might not necessarily have to, say, process raw Landsat data yourself. Um, that's something that's uh, definitely out there and available. And if it's not available for your study area, um, you can always contact uh, the Landsat team or uh, do a data order through USGS, USGS Eros um, to make sure you're getting the data that you need. Um, so it's a really great option to use some of those pre-processed data products um, rather than having to do some of that processing like atmospheric corrections uh, yourself. So uh, we'll go ahead and post a link to some of those Landsat surface reflectance product that, products I mentioned um, after the Q&A session's over. All right, question 22. Sentinel-2 images are available at levels one and two. Depending on the level of atmospheric correction, does this atmospheric correction significantly affect NBR values? do we have to use level two for better results? Oh, awesome, so I feel like we, we just went over this question. Um, I would say that surface reflectance, when you can use it, is great. Um, it's definitely a better um, option if you have it. Um, and so we would recommend that typically for any land application that you're doing, um, surface reflectance is, is kind of a good standard to hopefully live up to. Um, but I would also say that if you have um, top of atmosphere reflectance, um, that's not necessarily something that isn't useful. Um, you'll want to, I guess, proceed with caution just because those influences of the atmosphere can change on a daily basis, which can sometimes uh, prevent your ability to compare um, images, even if they're still in the same area, um, just because the atmospheric conditions might be different um, each day. So you want to maybe figure out a way to account for that in some way. But um, thankfully, with the NBR, you're focused mostly on the difference normalized burn ratio um, for burn severity assessment. Um, so your ultimate burn severity is going to um, hinge more on that comparison between NBRs pre-fire and post-fire. So you'll probably still be able to get some, some sort of estimate 
of uh, burn severity with that as well. Um, and I think there are a few tutorials that maybe I mentioned during um, the presentation that I, that might actually use uh, top of atmosphere reflectance. I, I'm thinking the the UN spider tutorials. I, I'm not 100% sure, um, but I think for at least the Sentinel-2 Google Earth Engine one, um, they might use top of atmosphere reflectance for that. So um, I can definitely look more into that and and maybe flesh out this question a little bit more. Right. And question 23: Does the FMT fire mapping tool work globally, or is it only US? So this is a great question. I think that one thing that, that's important to keep in mind is that since the FMT is based off of uh, the Monitoring Trends and Burn Severity Project standards uh, for mapping burn severity, um, a lot of those methods are more uh, tuned toward the United States, toward landscapes that you might uh, find burning within the US. Um, so some of the methods might not necessarily be appropriate um, for every landscape across the globe, um, but I do believe that you can use this tool um, for imagery that you collect yourself. Um, and I, I would imagine that that would just be a difference in ordering the imagery. So one of the steps in the FMT is ordering your imagery through the, the QGIS interface. Um, in this case, you might end up having to uh, say, get your own Landsat imagery from Earth Explorer or something like that for whatever your area is. Um, and then, and then completing the rest of the process once you've loaded that data into the FMT. I'll, I'll make sure I, I check in on this just to make sure that that's possible. Um, but I, I, I would imagine that you could use the FMT um, for fires around the globe if, if you're willing to import your own data and potentially process it yourself ahead of time. Awesome, so question 24. Many thanks for this excellent presentation. Thank you. Um, is the FMT tool restricted to fires in the US territory or is it global? Thanks a lot. This is actually good because I don't think I said everything that I needed to say in question 23. Um, so the FMT tool um, is typically restricted, as I mentioned, to, to the US in terms of ordering data. Um, and I think that's something to, to continue to keep in mind just because the way that the tool itself works will, will vary depending on um, the type of data that's ingested into the system. So for example, within the United States, we might not necessarily have as densely vegetated um, areas as, as say, your global study area that you might be interested in. Um, so maybe the thresholding that's suggested by the FMT tool isn't necessarily appropriate for what you're doing. But it might also be able to produce that difference normalized burn ratio for you, um, which then you could potentially threshold yourself. So I, I do think that there are a, a couple of, of opportunities to um, use the FMT tool to your advantage, and then maybe also just um, recognize how that process works within QGIS, and then maybe you even have the opportunity to just do that on your own um, within QGIS as well. And I'll, I'll go ahead and mention that um, those UN Spider tutorials that I, that I mentioned within the slides also provide you with um, a lot of great ways to start engaging with burn severity mapping um, in, uh, for both Landsat 8 and Sentinel-2 um, in QGIS, R, as well as Google Earth Engine, and I think Python too. Um, so it gives you um, some really great opportunities to start figuring out what methodology might work best for you um, and, and how you can start uh, doing your own burn severity mapping, uh, kind of regardless of what tools are uh, available to you, since there are so many different ways to do it. Awesome, so question 25. How accurate is the MODIS and VIRS burned area product in terms of commission and omission areas for CES grasslands? Is it possible to detect burnt areas through SAR imagery and glass crescents? Okay, awesome. So um, I can't necessarily um, speak to the accuracy of the MODIS and VIRS burned area product for grasslands. Um, I would think that for MODIS especially, um, as we noted, that's a little bit more stable um, of a, a data product in its version six. Um, so I would say that that product is likely pretty accurate for grasslands. Um, and I think you have the added benefit of that, that data kind of going through an analyst and a quality control process to make sure that burned areas are fully captured. Um, but with VIRS, as we mentioned, there's, there are some uh, caveats to that 
that data product um, and its uses um, within specific types of landscapes and its overall kind of reliability at this stage in its first version. Um, and if you're talking about the Modus and Veers uh, combined uh, near real-time product that we've been discussing, um, that one, uh, as I mentioned before, is I, I believe more um, linked to thermal anomaly data. So that's not necessarily something that is 100% accurate for any landscape, um, but it does give you kind of that good initial assessment um, in a near real-time fashion for, for fires and burned areas. Um, and then as we talked about um, a little bit earlier with our discussion of Sentinel-1 SAR, um, the case study that's provided on that slide uh, within the presentation is an example of using SAR data um, within a savanna grassland um, in Northern Australia. So that SAR data is, is hopefully gonna be helpful for a lot of different kinds of grassland ecosystems in the future. I'd say that these methodologies aren't necessarily as refined um, especially for burn severity mapping um, and burned area mapping as well. But I think that's something you're going to see um, become more and more present within our discussions of using SAR imagery. Um, and that study does a really good job of showing how uh, the data that you get from Sentinel-1 SAR can be used for um, mapping burned area and burn severity within a grassland. So I would definitely take a look at that um, and keep an eye out for, for future work and publications uh, related to um, using SAR imagery for burn area and burn severity mapping. Question 26. Does the land fire disturbance data provide other disturbance types, uh, such as hurricanes, beetle infestations, et cetera? Um, and does the data set slash website, website have a manual? Yes, so um, on that exact slide, uh, the land fire disturbance data, um, slide within the presentation, I provided a link to the data specifications, um, which provides information about all of the data layers that you can find within Landfire. Um, that specific uh, disturbance layer that I was displaying on the slide, um, it shows a, a variety of disturbance types. I'm not really sure about beetle infestations, but I know extreme weather events are on there. Um, I think de deforestation events are on there as well. Um, so that can give you a pretty good idea within the US of the different types of disturbance that have happened within your areas, not just wildfires. Um, and then definitely follow that link on the slide um, to get a better idea of, of each of the data sets and what their data specifications are. Um, and those will link you to different manuals that are available, um, different charts describing the metadata of the data layers, um, things like that. And hopefully you'll be able to find um, the information that, that you need to do that. Okay, question 27. Are there any methods to prevent forest fires? So it's kind of a loaded question. It's a little bit beyond the scope of, of this presentation since we're mostly talking about remote sensing methods um, to assess that, uh, that risk detection and analysis of fires. Um, but I think it's important to keep in mind that there are um, a variety of management techniques um, out there and available carried out by different institutions to prevent forest fires. Um, one of the biggest ones there and kind of a hot topic is prescribed burns. Um, and those are basically just burns to get rid of some underbrush and dead biomass um, that can account for some of these really severely burning and large fires. Um, so I'd say definitely look a little bit more into prescribed burning. Um, look into how forest management works within uh, your area. If there's a government institution that's doing that or a nonprofit. Um, as I mentioned, there's, there's a variety of ways to, to look at preventing forest fires. Um, that's not necessarily something that we're um, going into detail within this series, um, but you should be able to find a lot of information about that um, in your own search of, of regulations and procedures that um, your kind of governing bodies take out themselves. So question 28, is there any particular reason to use the NDR index as opposed to NGVI, uh, for example, to assess vegetation regrowth post fire? So there's no particular reason to use the, the NBR over the NDVI. Um, it ends up kind of coming down to whatever you, th you seem to think detects vegetation better. Um, the one thing that I'll say about um, continuing the use of NBR to, to map vegetation regrowth is um, it can tend to be a little bit more simplistic since if you're already calculating your, your normalized burn ratio, if you're doing a DNBR, then calculating NBR at various time scales after that can be um, relatively simple. 
um, and you'll know that you're capturing the same metric over time, so you won't be misclassifying like unburned vegetation or maybe something that wasn't captured um, within your NBR. Um, it's just a nice way to, to continuously map the change of a landscape using that normalized burn ratio. Um, that said, the NDVI um, is also great for mapping vegetation regeneration. That's a little bit more attuned to vegetation specifically. Um, so rather than assessing reductions in burned areas with the NBR, um, you'd be more directly measuring um, the regrowth of vegetation with an NDVI. Um, they're just kind of different proxies to get at the same question, um, with the NDVI being a little bit more specific and attuned um, to mapping vegetation itself. Um, so you might find that that's a little bit easier for, for delineating um, vegetation within your burned area. Um, so it really does kind of come down to what works best for you, but if you're just interested in vegetation, if you're just in, interested in looking at vegetation post-fire, the NDVI is probably a good way to go just because you're, you're specifically interested in that vegetation. Um, and as I mentioned, um, other than the NDVI, there are a few other uh, vegetation indices that we've gone over that might be helpful for your area. And question 29, do you recommend that all studies use burn severity or vegetation regrowth products also complete some ground truthing or are all these products robust enough to be used uh, standalone in some cases? So some of these products can definitely be used in, in standalone cases. They can be used um, themselves. When we're talking about uh, ground truthing um, and, and validation by going out into the field and collecting data, we're typically talking about kind of like this, this gold standard or ideal situation, like if possible, if you can do that, it's a great idea. Um, and that kind of goes for most remote sensing. If you can go out into the field, take some field data or field samples that you can use for validation, or to at least make sure you're kind of headed in the right direction with your analysis, um, that's always great. That's always kind of like the best case scenario. Um, but if that's not something that's possible for you, um, these products are definitely um, a pretty robust option to use um, to do initial assessments of vegetation regrowth, uh, burn severity mapping, burned area. Um, and they've they've been around for long enough that these procedures are pretty well um, thought out. There are some standard operating procedures, as we've mentioned, um, available through, through things like the MTBS um, and other uh, vegetation mapping uh, tools and procedures. Um, but yeah, I think it's it's just important to take into account that Within remote sensing, you're not necessarily capturing everything on the ground. Um, so in opportunities that you have to go into the field and collect data that can be used to validate your work, that's great. Um, and if not, uh, remote sensing is still a really useful, valuable tool um, for looking at uh, burn severity mapping and vegetation regrowth, kind of regardless of your ability to go into the field. So question 30, would you recommend high split trajectory analysis as a tool to examine airflow prior to a fire and or uh, movement of smoke post fire, or is it better to use a remote sensing tool specifically developed for this purpose? Awesome. So I think um, at least within Blanca's work, and as far as I understand it, um, the high split trajectory analysis um, is a useful way to look at the movement of parcels of air, um, especially within a distinct geographic range. Um, and I, I'm not sure exactly what Blanca herself would recommend, um, but that does appear to be the way that they went about it in the case study um, for looking at air movement um, over Mexico. So my my preliminary answer to this um, is that the high split trajectory analysis is a is a great way to um, map that airflow, um, and it seems to be um, a good standard uh, based off of that case study that we saw from from Blanca and her colleagues. Um, but we can definitely forward some of these questions to her, um, since she's much more of an expert on her own research, um, to make sure that we're fully capturing um, uh, the full answers to these questions. All right, so question 31. Is it possible to use burnt area products to determine wildfire susceptibility of an area? or only active fire products can be used for this. So I'm not 100% sure um, what you're asking here, but um, when we're talking about wildfire susceptibility of an area, we're typically talking at that pre-fire stage of, of analysis. 
So I would refer back to sessions one and two on determining wildfire susceptibility within an area. Um, and when we look at susceptibility, we're typically thinking about things like temperature, humidity, uh, vegetation, fuel conditions, um, things like that. Um, and burnt area is more of just a way to uh, assess the impacts post fire, um, to look at the full extent of the fire, um, as well as the reduction of burned areas. So I think your next question of that, or only active fire products can be used for this. Um, that's more of a during fire metric as well. Um, so that's mostly for uh, detecting fires um, with some information about the extent of those fires as well. Um, but if what you're really looking at is getting at uh, susceptibility of an area uh, to fire, I would definitely um, refer back to those sessions one and two. Question 32, uh, where can we get Landsat level three burned area science product algorithm description and maybe implementation code. Um, so I'm not sure about implementation code itself. Um, I'm not sure that's available, um, but here's the website for the USGS Landsat burned area product um, where more information can be found, um, including a document that describes the algorithm used. Um, so that's a really good resource to use um, to see if, if you might be able to implement something similar yourself um, as far as Landsat imagery goes in your area if you're outside of the United States. Um, and I think it's also important to, to look at some of the other information on that burned area product page um, to see if there are any other resources that you might find helpful or if there are any plans or projects uh, to maybe take something like that global. Um, you might also be able to find some contact information um, from the USGS uh, Landsat Processing Group um, just to see if, if that's something that you might be able to get for an area that's outside of the United States. Um, but isn't necessarily um, available online at this moment. Um, but yeah, so if you're if you're interested in that burned area algorithm, uh, definitely take a look at this link, um, and you should be able to find some of the documentation that you're looking for. And with that, I think we want to end relatively on time. Um, so I think we'll go ahead and stop questions, um, and we'll go ahead and make sure that we answer all of the questions here in the doc, and then we'll make sure to post that. Um, on the website uh, for all of you to reference after this. Um, so with that, I think we can go ahead and wrap things up. Um, I just want to thank you all for joining over the course of the past three weeks. Um, we know it was a pretty long training. We hope you learned a lot. Um, and thanks so much for joining us. We really appreciate it.